18% of overall emission. But livestock is about half of that 18%. Wow. And almost all of that is beef. Is this is almost eight to one. You use eight calories right. to feed that cow for every calorie of meat you get out because you're building bone and respiration for that cow. Do you think you are consciously making the so-called safest choices for your food and health care? Wrong. What if the truth is, it's Bill Gates who's quietly influencing your food and health choices. He is catering to you with only those choices he wants you to make because that would make him more profit, while you'd think you are choosing the best of everything in the market. I know it sounds more like a conspiracy theory, but I have evidence. Did you know Gates owns over 269,000 acres of farmland, making him the one of the largest private farmland owners in the US? You'd also be surprised to know that some of the meat alternatives you consume now come from lab-grown or plant-based sources instead of conventional organic meat. And behind everything, there's a group of powerful billionaires, and amidst them, a prominent name is none other than Bill Gates. That's right. The man who built a tech empire now suddenly holds the keys to a massive portion of America's agriculture and exerts influence on healthcare discussions. But that's just the beginning. While Gates presents himself as a champion of sustainable farming and green technology, some critics argue that his influence in these sectors might be more about consolidating power and wealth than saving the planet. In this video, we're diving deep into the controversial investments Gates has made in alternative foods like lab-grown meat and genetically modified crops, as well as his push for renewable energy. Is his involvement in these industries a selfless effort to solve global crises? Or is it part of a larger plan to monopolize his power and resources? We'll connect the dots between Gates and historical figures like the Rockefellers, those who used their wealth to shape entire industries and manipulate markets. Maybe we are witnessing the rise of a new kind of monopoly, where all of us would be puppets while people like Bill Gates control everything. Bill Gates' backstory raises some interesting questions, especially when you think about the usual narrative that tech giants are all started in their garages. While Gates and Jeff Bezos both have that classic tale, digging a bit deeper shows that Gates didn't build Microsoft all on his own. A big part of Microsoft's foundation came from his family, particularly his mom, Mary Maxwell Gates. Her close ties with John Akers, who used to be the CEO of IBM, played a key role in helping Microsoft rise to fame. Back in the early 1970s, Microsoft was just another small company with no standout products. But thanks to Mary's connections, IBM decided to give Microsoft a sweet contract, which really kickstarted their success. At that point, Gates was just a teenager, and it was really his mom's influence that set Microsoft up for the future. Gates's dad, Bill Gates Sr., was a well-known lawyer in Seattle and had a huge hand in turning the city into a biotech and tech hotspot. His legal expertise helped various businesses, including Starbucks and Physio Control, a medical device company that changed the game with innovative licensing and royalty agreements. This kind of business model, which allows companies to sell their products repeatedly, has had a lasting impact on many industries today. As Microsoft grew, Gates Sr. took on the role of general counsel and his law firm, K and L Gates became a big player in lobbying and corporate law. This all shows that Gates' success wasn't just a solo effort. It was heavily supported by his family's connections and business acumen. There's also a family connection worth mentioning. Gates Sr. served as a national director for Planned Parenthood, a nonprofit American organization that provides sexual health care in the United States and globally. Now, in case you didn't know, the origins of Planned Parenthood are tied to the Rockefeller family, especially Margaret Sanger, who was influenced by their funding and ideas. The Rockefellers were concerned about overpopulation, which is a view shared by both Gates Sr. and Jr. Bill Gates Jr. has openly said he thinks the world is overpopulated, and he'd like to see a significant population reduction. Planned Parenthood has pushed the idea that women should focus on careers over family and kids, suggesting that having children can be bad for the planet. This fits into a larger agenda that discourages childbirth for various reasons, from lifestyle choices to financial concerns. The infamous Jaffe memo, written by the former vice president of Planned Parenthood, Frederick Jaffe, 
outlined strategies for lowering birth rates, with abortion highlighted as a primary method, along with various contraceptives, including funding for potential anti-fertility vaccines targeting a hormone that regulates fertility. As Gates keeps vaccines on a pedestal as a way to lower birth rates, critics are questioning his real motives. They wonder how his mission to save lives from diseases like malaria and smallpox aligns with his concerns about overpopulation. Gates argues that saving lives in developing countries leads to smaller family sizes, because parents feel more secure about their children's survival. However, many people find this reasoning totally unconvincing. Things worsen during the COVID-19 pandemic, as there have been claims about infertility and health issues after the COVID vaccination. Gates was a big investor in BioNTech, which partnered with Pfizer to make the COVID vaccine. We can't just deny this financial gain here. Plus, the origins of the coronavirus pandemic have also been questioned. What was initially brushed off as a conspiracy theory is now gaining traction, with more evidence suggesting that a SARS-CoV-2 might have come from a lab. This raises further questions about public health narratives and the influence of powerful figures on policy decisions. Additionally, the backlash against the Gates Foundation in countries like India, following HPV vaccine trials that were linked to several reports of adverse events, complicates his motive behind global health initiatives. Naturally, it's strange to think how a tech genius who made a business in the software industry transitioned to healthcare. He just used two things for this, money and his wife's organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Speaking of money, Gates himself is a prominent investor, and everybody knows real estate is one of the most profitable sectors in the current market and future for investment. As a result, he made a big investment in agriculture, owning almost 242,000 acres of US farmland. But don't think the idea behind his investment is so simple here. When he owns all the farmland, it means he has control over the future of organic and small-scale farming. Plus, this move is making it harder for new and small-scale farmers to compete as land prices keep rising. For example, farmland value has jumped from under $1,500 an acre in the mid-1990s to more than $3,160 in 2020, making it a hot investment. In other words, Gates again secured a monopoly here. Besides, he's also heavily backing genetically modified organisms, GMOs, and alternative meat products like Impossible Foods and lab-grown meat companies such as Good Meat and Upside Foods. The goal? To modernize food production and reduce dependence on traditional animal farming. Because when you keep killing a particular animal, chances are one day it might go extinct, harming the environmental balance. On the other hand, synthetic meat can help combat climate change by cutting greenhouse gas emissions and saving forests. While on the surface level, everything looks beneficial, this approach actually clashes with the principles of holistic health. Holistic health promotes natural, organic, and sustainable farming practices that prioritize whole foods, biodiversity, and ethical animal treatment. After all, this is the most natural way. Firstly, the push for synthetic meat and GMOs poses a challenge to traditional farming and small-scale operations. So, these smaller farms already struggle with tough regulations and competition from large-scale industrial farming, and the move toward lab-produced food could make it even harder for them to survive. Plus, the production of lab-grown meat is energy-intensive, similar to pharmaceutical manufacturing, and may actually have a bigger environmental footprint than conventional farming. And the long-term health effects of eating synthetic foods aren't fully understood, and there could be hidden chemicals and additives with unknown impacts. So, in simple terms, it's already harming nature, but in a different way. With that, it's harmful to us also. But Gates' support for synthetic and plant-based alternatives often comes with significant funding for media and research, which helps shape public opinions about the sustainability of traditional versus modern farming. His push for countries to switch to synthetic beef raises concerns about limiting consumer choice, as new regulations could make conventional meat less accessible. And with Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, there is the Rockefeller Foundation as well. They have a lot of influence over agricultural agendas, particularly in developing areas like Africa. Particularly as people get richer, they tend to eat more meat. If we don't do anything, this sector will actually 
grow over time. But this has led to some heated debates about what his involvement really means. Is it really what he says, or is that just manipulation? Critics argue that while these initiatives often claim to help reduce poverty and improve food security, they tend to favor industrial and market-based solutions rather than traditional, sustainable practices. It looks like these foundations are more focused on pushing for technology and corporate interests instead of genuinely addressing local needs or empowering small-scale farmers. And this is not just me randomly claiming all these. A report from the Global Policy Forum points out how much power these major American foundations, including Gates, have in shaping global health and agricultural priorities. With assets totaling over $360 billion, they contribute billions each year to causes they favor, often partnering with public and private sectors. This financial tie-up lets them influence policy agendas and international strategies, sometimes leaving traditional governance systems like the United Nations in the dust. In agriculture, they often highlight biotech and corporate farming solutions, which has drawn a lot of criticism. For example, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, co-founded by the Gates and Rockefeller Foundations, has faced backlash for pushing technologies like genetically modified GM seeds onto African markets. Critics say this move benefits only the US agribusiness rather than truly meeting local agricultural needs. The Gates Foundation has faced particularly harsh scrutiny for its preference for industrial farming techniques and biotechnology. It's the second largest donor to the World Health Organization, WHO, after the US, and it invests in biotech firms and major corporations like Monsanto. Now this raises concerns about conflicts of interest. You can see this approach in action with Gavi, the vaccine alliance backed by Gates, where the cost of fully vaccinating a child skyrocketed by 68 times between 2001 and 2014, all because of a focus on proprietary medical solutions instead of cost-effective ones. When it comes to food, the Gates Foundation has been steering African food systems toward a model that heavily relies on patented seeds, synthetic fertilizers, and pesticides. While this shift aims to boost crop yields and reduce poverty, it often traps farmers in cycles of debt due to high input costs. It also leads to soil degradation, reduced biodiversity, and more corporate control over local farming practices. African civil society groups and researchers argue that the Gates Foundation's model actually worsens food insecurity and deepens social inequities rather than solving them. They see the Foundation's efforts as a modern form of neocolonialism with manipulation where the priority is only the Western corporate interests over the needs of African farmers. Looking at the Gates Foundation's grants up to 2020, it becomes clear that most of its agricultural funding goes to institutions in North America and Europe, instead of directly supporting African organizations. Nearly 90% of grants for NGOs are awarded to groups based in the Global North, while less than 10% goes to African organizations. For example, AGRA, one of the Foundation's main initiatives had about two-thirds of its budget allocated to distributing new seeds and chemicals to African farmers through networks of corporations and public agencies. Despite receiving significant funding, AGRA has not met its goals. It achieved only an 18% increase in crop yields over 12 years and a 30% rise in undernourishment in its target countries. On top of that, the Gates Foundation's ongoing push for genetically modified organisms, GMOs, and biofortified crops also raises eyebrows about the neglect of traditional seed systems, which still supply most seeds used in African agriculture. The Foundation has not invested in programs to support local seed conservation. Instead, it has spent millions of dollars promoting large-scale farming methods. For example, it has put $73 million into biofortification projects taking money away from other sustainable nutrition efforts. And that's not where the Gates Foundation stops. It even influences agricultural policies by funding various initiatives and forming partnerships. It organizes forums where global leaders and decision makers discuss agricultural reforms, often supporting business-friendly policies that help seed and pesticide companies. And this activity raises some important questions about what the long-term health consequences might be when we prioritize GMOs and synthetic foods over time-honored dietary practices. 
To really understand the conflict, let's take a closer look at Gates' investments in synthetic food technologies. While these innovations are marketed as the answer to global hunger and resource scarcity, they often clash with the principles of clean and natural diets that countless cultures have relied on for generations. When we neglect these natural food systems, we're not just impacting health, we're also putting cultural identities and historical dietary wisdom at risk. Moreover, the fact that someone like Gates seems to have only one goal all the time, monopolizing food production. No wonder this is a clear red flag about the implications of having a single individual or corporation control such significant parts of our global food systems. But the way Bill Gates is moving, it looks like we don't have much time in hand. It's only a matter of time before this concentration of power will decide what food you will eat, what disease you will have, like taking full control of you. Because once the monopoly starts, you will go to the food stores and see only those items which they want you to use. The potential for this kind of monopolization threatens the rich diversity of agricultural practices that not only support nutrition and health, we also can't ignore the environmental and ethical aspects of Gates' approach to food production. While apparently this may look like eco-friendly food choices, industrial farming techniques, synthetic fertilizers, and GMOs actually contribute to environmental degradation more in the long term, which goes against holistic and sustainable health. But how? The use of synthetic inputs in farming is linked to issues like soil quality degradation, loss of biodiversity, and increased greenhouse gas emissions. Public health initiatives, especially those supported by global organizations associated with Gates, often focus on pharmaceutical solutions. This approach tends to overlook natural and homeopathic treatments. We've seen this tendency particularly during pandemic responses, where the focus has been on rapidly developing and distributing vaccines rather than exploring a more holistic health approach that includes natural remedies and traditional practices. The reason? The relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and global health organizations often appears to prioritize profit over genuine well-being. The math is quite simple. If you think about a long-term game, money equals power and it plays a huge role in politics and decision-making. While it's easy to point fingers at politicians, the real puppeteers often turn out to be billionaires. Take the pandemic, for example. Figures like Bill Gates had a surprising amount of investment in health policies, even though he didn't have medical training. It's pretty alarming that while only the rich got richer, the poor got poorer during that tough time. Billionaires really showed their influence during the pandemic through their ties to organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Events like Event 201, which focused on coronaviruses, made it clear that they were ready to capitalize on a pandemic while also pushing for information control through censorship. Back in 2009, a meeting involving billionaires like Gates and Soros tackled global health and population control where they talked about things like contraceptives and abortion to deal with overpopulation. This is nothing but a clear coordinated effort to shape public policy, often using climate change as a cause to manipulate the masses. One of the great tragedies about climate is that it's the poorest in the world, the farmers who live fairly near to the equator, that all this heat and flooding and droughts, they're going to suffer by far the most. Some, like Ted Turner, even argue for drastically reducing the global population, a viewpoint that has roots in the eugenics movement. Groups like the Club of Rome tie fears of overpopulation to climate change narratives, suggesting that humanity itself is the issue. This kind of thinking influences initiatives like the Paris Climate Accords and the WHO Pandemic Treaty, which aim to shift power from individual nations to global institutions, as we saw with some of the authoritarian responses during COVID-19. In simple terms, we're seeing a troubling trend towards a surveillance state with things like digital IDs and central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, which threaten our privacy and personal freedoms. And it starts with what we eat, what we use for health, and then it goes to what we do. And believe it or not, AI is a big part of this control. There is no doubt that AI is more helpful to billionaires than to you, me, or billions of common people. You can already see AI is potentially leading to massive job losses, 
and raising the idea of Universal Basic Income UBI, as a way to keep society in check. The interesting part is that society doesn't include the billionaires. The idea is that everyone will be a part of society and its control will be in the hands of billionaires like Bill Gates. Billionaires like Gates seized the opportunity during the pandemic to push for tighter control measures, framing it as a way to test global governance. The way many people lost their jobs due to vaccination requirements during the pandemic shows how quickly individuals can be made to follow government rules. Central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, promote more control by the government, leading us to question the future of work and our humanity. With all the new technology, we're looking at things like contactless payments and implanted digital IDs. This means a worrying trend toward a society that prioritizes efficiency over personal freedoms. Let me give you another intriguing example. Gates has also poured a lot of money into biotechnology, especially mRNA technology for various diseases. But no one has barely any idea about what that means for our health. Research on chimeric viruses shifted to China, where ethical standards are more relaxed, drawing unsettling parallels with the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and showcasing the ruling class's priorities. As conversations around future pandemics and the rise of AI continue, it feels like we're heading toward a level of control that's eerily similar to China's social credit system. And if nothing stops this advancement of Gates, we will soon become a part of a crazy dystopia where everything we do would be directly or indirectly dictated by billionaires like Bill Gates. The solution? You know, perhaps a left-leaning perspective might suggest we tackle this issue by looking at antitrust laws, or considering things like wealth caps, or even a wealth tax. The idea would be to limit how much power wealthy individuals have to influence government decisions that benefit them. Plus, I'd say we need to be cautious with regulations because they can sometimes lead to unintended consequences. One of the biggest things we can do is take personal responsibility and vote with our wallets. It might sound simple, but buying local can actually be pretty challenging since it's often more expensive. The key is to avoid supporting monopolies whenever possible. Maybe consider starting a little backyard garden and raising some chickens for your food. It's all about making those choices with your spending. When it comes to regulations, I think we should really rethink funding public-private partnerships. It feels like welfare for the wealthy. Take organizations like the World Economic Forum or the World Health Organization. Why are we using our tax dollars to support them? Bill Gates already contributes a lot to the WHO, so why do we need to chip in too? A lot of taxpayer money ends up going to help corporations. For example, Gates owns TerraPower, his nuclear power venture, which receives tens of millions or even over a hundred million in taxpayer support. If it's a good idea, then why should it rely on taxpayer welfare? Do you agree? If not, what else do you think is the best way to address this problem? Drop your views in the comment section. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more eye-opening anecdotes. And don't forget to share this video to expose the truth and let's return to nature for real health solutions.